Hello. Welcome. Hi. Welcome to episode four of Community. We're here with uh, Lotus Soph. Hi. Hello. Thank hello. you so much for coming on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to have you on because you've been somebody that, like, I've noticed in the community that's kind of paved their own way, um, especially focusing on kind of vinyl and record mm -hmm. um, aspect of mixing. So, yeah, how, how, does, how did that happen? How does that um, come about? Like in Miami in particular? Or in yeah, yeah. Um, so I originally grew up here um, and but was not part of the scene or anything like that. I went to New World, so I was very much involved with like the arts community okay. in a way, but I was still so young and then went to Gainesville and that was kind of where the DJing began. Okay. Um, so when I moved back, I had already sort of established the sound that I knew I liked to play. So that kind of helped guide my direction in terms of where I um, put my energy towards for places and parties and collectives that I wanted to play at and play with. Mm -hmm. um, so the first event that I played was Prohibida, which is yeah. the Baile Funk Party. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a really great start coming mm -hmm. back. Um, and then from there, I just did as much I guess legwork you could say as I could to put myself out there as a vinyl DJ and just sort of learn what the spaces were for okay. that, which took some time, um, eventually leading me here to MCR too. Yeah. But yeah, so started last year when I moved back from Gainesville. So around February is, since is when I've been back. Okay. And then you, so you started off in Gainesville. What was yeah. the scene kind of like? Okay. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I think there was not a lot of a scene, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, it's a really special place because it is so small and it's lots and lots and lots of people in your age. Yeah. So we all kind of want to do the same thing and go party and, you know. Yeah. Um, but so there was like a small handful of venues really that you could play at, which was helpful in terms of just getting through, getting in the door, mm -hmm. you know, at those spaces. Um, but you also end up just going like, how do I say, um, getting stuck in a box, if you yeah. will, with some yeah. of the DJing and the scene there, because a lot of the scene is catered toward college kids, which um, a lot of the venues did lean toward more mainstream electronic music. Mm -hmm. So that was like one part of it. Um, so my early, I guess, months, you could say, in the scene there were playing at, you know, one of the two main venues really um and it was mainly like very like tech house and stuff like that yeah. deep house um and it really changed for me when i started playing vinyl and that opened other doors okay yeah yeah how was that like transitioning to vinyl in gainesville i would say it was very special and unexpected in that there were spaces i didn't even think of playing at before okay whereas prior i'm playing at you know arcade bar and signal and you know, these are spaces that, again, like I said, are, you know, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., Strictly House. Mm -hmm. Now I'm playing, you know, open format records at this new jazz bar that opened or mm -hmm. at this um, food park on a Sunday during brunch or at this wine and plant garden, you know, again, brunch hour records or like at this bar playing all my rock and just other genres. So it was like very freeing to not be like limited to like a four hour set of tech house. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Such a relief, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. Okay, so you, then you mentioned that you grew up here, right? Um, I'm guessing that you most likely come from Hispanic descent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, where are your parents' uh, backgrounds? Yeah, so my dad's uh, family, his side is from Cuba, and okay. then my mom is from Brazil. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, awesome. and then I was born here. Okay, cool. Yep. And was there any like specific music that you remember listening to while you were growing up? Definitely. So it's funny because while they're both of different Hispanic and Latin backgrounds, they actually played a lot of like American music yeah. growing up. Like my dad played a lot of like Stevie Wonder and Jackson okay. Brown, like Steely Dan, 
Steel Pulse, a lot of reggae, and then my mom played a lot of like Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and Alice in Chains. So I grew up listening to like so much classic rock, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> like, like I did good. not grow up listening to electronic music at all, uh -huh. um, nor did I really grow up listening to a lot of salsa. If I did, it was like because I heard it on the radio. Mm -hmm. um, and if I listened to Brazilian music, it'd be while I was in Brazil. Okay. Um, just being there, hearing it, you know, at family gatherings and stuff like that. Um, and I would say that influence came later when it came to the vinyl and okay. stuff. Yeah. Cool. And then did you ever learn any instruments or were you ever musical when you were growing up? Yeah. So when I was really young, my parents put me in a program at UM where we could start getting musical training. And as little as like a toddler, you're learning how to play the xylophone. And then eventually, as you get older, move up to the keyboard, eventually the piano. So that was like mm -hmm. the main instrument of choice for like most of my upbringing okay. um, until high school. Then I abandoned it for ballet. <laughs> yeah. So then you went to school at, cause you went to, you said new, new world. Yeah. yeah, new world. So that, that is like more of um, like a art centric. So you focused mm -hmm. on ballet there? Yeah. So? Yeah. So there's um, dance, music, art and theater at mm -hmm. the school. And I auditioned for dance and um, pretty much to make that possible, I sort of had to let go of almost all other hobbies okay. um, to just give that as much attention yeah. as possible. Including yeah. the piano. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Have you picked it up since then or no? No, if anything, um, I, I had a, I brought my old keyboard with me to Gainesville a couple of years ago and would just play around on that for fun sometimes. And mm -hmm. I got lucky during college, my roommate at the time had a synthesizer and a neighbor of mine who was also a producer from Brazil had a drum machine. So I kind of wow. used those musical skills that I could remember mm -hmm. to just start playing, you know, electronic music mm -hmm. on, on their machines. Got you. Yeah. And did you ever get into producing around that time or no? No, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I did play one live set, oh, which wow. I was like, Whoa. wow, this is way scarier than DJing. I bet. <laughs> I could <laughs> I never. Like, oh my gosh so much credit to everyone like who performs live yeah honestly um, but yeah after that i i feel like i didn't have a clear direction for whatever sound i would want to produce at the time i think now i have more clear ideas if i were to get into it, what i'd want to make but at the time i figured i i saw how much work it was gonna take to grow as a vinyl dj and mm -hmm. to like learn and practice that craft that i figured okay i'm gonna focus on that yeah. for now because it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it is hard, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then everybody, you know, like, uh, we learned a little bit about, like, what mm -hmm. your parents were listening to and stuff, but everybody kind of has, like, an awakening for their own personal music. Yeah. You kind of remember when was, like, the period of time and what you were listening to when you first found your own kind of music, you know? Yeah. Um, I think in terms of electronic music, that awakening happened sometime in high school when a family friend sent me a mix on SoundCloud and like my life was changed forever. <laughs> um, you remember the mix? Yeah. Yeah, what I do. It? Um, it was by Ninz, which is a German producer okay. or um, no, I can't pronounce the name really well, but yeah, we yeah. can link it yeah, somewhere yeah, yeah. below. We could do that. I for will sure. um, reference that mix, but yeah, I'll, I'll never forget that mix. <laughs> um, but that was my first sort of introduction to electronic music. Okay. And it was very dub, sort of mellow, like oh. down tempo. Okay. Um, and yeah, from there, just started exploring electronic music more and more over the years until I nailed mm -hmm. down the sound that I like to play. Okay, so. nice. And what was the inspiration for you to get into specifically like records, like vinyl? So my dad has like a crazy huge collection. Really? So he'd always been collecting vinyl. And so for my whole upbringing, that's been like something I was always exposed to. And, mm -hmm. you know, in high school when I would be staying with him, I would have the chance to play some records for my friends and like introduce them to that. And I remember like we would, I would play craft work with my friends nice. and we would go way too high and listen <laughs> to a lot of craft work. Yeah. <laughs> on vinyl which was cool oh, I bet um, yeah and then over the years my dad would um, be like hey you know you can have this record you have this record and so he started he helped me start building the collection gotcha. so you know I'm like have like maybe a small stack at some point and um, so yeah that was always kind of part of my life in mm -hmm. a way um, and 
it became a more central focus when I decided I wanted to start DJing vinyl. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, I have a good base to start from. Also, um, while I was in college, my dad and my brother cleared out my Awada storage unit and she had a mm. lot of yeah. records, a nice. lot, like a lot of salsa, a lot of disco. Okay. And they were like, I don't want this. I'm like, yeah. I'll take it. That's, that's awesome. I love <laughs> so that. I'm like, yep. Yeah. So that was like some of the first stuff I started DJing with was like those records pretty much. Um, and then from there, I'm like, okay, well, I need new records for the next gig and the yeah. next gig and the next exactly. gig. So now it's accumulated to, you know, the collection keeps growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I got you. And did your uh, dad ever play music um, out to people or was he? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, he's a drummer. Oh, he's a drummer. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So um, growing up, my brother and I were like always going to his gigs. Nice. Was he in a band or like covering mm -hmm. or anything like that? Yeah, he plays in a few different bands. Some do originals. Some are cover bands. Mm -hmm. They're different genres. Some have, you know, several multi-instrumentalists. Yeah. And whole bunch going on That's so really cool. yeah that was always a part of my brother and i's upbringing for nice. sure so you're always like surrounded by music mm -hmm. for the most part nice yeah that's really cool and then um what was kind of like the record scene uh, in terms of like record shops and stuff like that up in gainesville what was that like no nothing <laughs> nothing empty yeah <laughs> quiet so how'd you collect anything <laughs> there it was just coming back home and getting stuff or there used to be a great shop I think it was called Radioactive Records. They closed around the time I started spinning. So when okay. I was playing, there was, from what I remember, one shop here again. Love them. Mm -hmm. But um, not a lot of selections that were what I was looking for yeah. to play. Yeah. So it was very, very limited. I'd say any time I was going to Orlando, I'd stop at Donut Shop, 1010 Recommend Donut Shop in Orlando. Okay. Um, or whenever I was down in Miami, um, if I was traveling to see my brother up north, I'll go to a record shop. Pretty much my strategy isn't so much to just rely on the record stores where I live, but almost any time I'm anywhere, mm -hmm. I make it a point to go to a record store while I'm there. Yeah. So a lot of the collecting happened when I would leave Gainesville, yeah. if anything. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the spaces, like there were some cool spots that did have turntables, which I'm really grateful for. Okay. Um, to play at, but what really saved me was um, there is a teeny vinyl DJ community there, okay. and one of the DJs was really great in helping me get started. Um, so when I had my first ever gig, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm really excited. Also, I don't have turntables. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, how no. am I even going to play? <laughs> so this one DJ was like, oh, I have a spare pair of techniques and a mixer you can use them and hold wow. on to them as long as you need wow. so suddenly i had the whole setup at my house and shout out dj wax adam in gainesville that's crazy um shout and out. yeah so i was able to practice on those and take them to gigs and um so even if there was like a gig that i was going to be doing like the one at the food park you know mm -hmm. on like a sunday afternoon while they don't have anything i was like that's fine i have the setup so i can yeah. bring it you know so i was like this is also before I had my UDG bag, so I'm like carrying yeah. creative records, Oof. like carrying turntables, carrying a mixer. I was like, yeah, labor of love. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so that was kind of what the beginning of the situation looked like in Gainesville. Now we have a couple more shops. Oh my gosh, I right. want to shout them out. Portal 4 Records. Nice. Amazing. If yeah. you're ever in Gainesville, if anyone's there, go, there go. shout out Luis. <laughs> um, also Luis, yeah. <laughs> there you um, go. And um, they're really fantastic. Also, um, a couple years ago, discovered this other shop in Ocala, Vinyl Oasis Ocala. Really, okay. really great. Um, not too far from Gainesville, and it's a great like day trip if you're you know want to get out of Gainesville and go see like the springs near Ocala and get some really good food. Stop at Vinyl Oasis. The owners are really great, really knowledgeable. I found like Mr. Fingers there. Wow. Like really, Whoa. really great records. That's really cool. Yeah. And you'll pick one out and he'll just start, he's like, oh, do you know who that is? Like, yeah. and he'll just give you the history Love on that. like the artist. And I'm like, this place is awesome. Like, yeah. so it was nice having that nearby, um, you know, so just being resourceful on like what other, you know, shops are around you because Gainesville is pretty small. Yeah, got you. What are other like record shops that you remember? They don't necessarily need to be in like Florida, yeah. but just in general that you kind of remember stick yeah. out. Definitely. So the first is Mount Vernon. Yay, yeah. Mount Vernon. Love them. <laughs> um, Will and Doc. 
they are really who helped me start my house music collection. Yeah, no um, way. They're in Baltimore. Oh, wow. And um, so that's where my brother's studying. So I go there quite often. And I remember the first time I went, like I told you, every time I travel somewhere, I'm like, okay, where should I be buying records? Yeah. And I saw that they were just opening. So one day, I think I got there like, I was so happened to be in Baltimore like the week of their opening or something. So I walk up to the shop and there wasn't a lot um, even like set up yet, but they were like, yeah, feel free to like start digging. Mm. And they have excellent prices and all of the music there is records that used to be part of their collections or other DJ friends in Baltimore's collections. Mm. Um, and just excellent excellent late 90s early 2000s house nice. and so the tradition became like anytime i'd go up there i'd pick like a massive stack they'd tape it up and like ship it to me in miami because mm -hmm. i never could fit it in my luggage yeah. <laughs> you know i'm usually taking like a 30 dollars spirit flight so yeah. i'm taking a backpack um so they're fantastic um love the music that they have and um they're just great great shop um nice. so that's a big one for sure for me um other than that I mean, of course, here in Miami, tea bag, you yeah. know, is like, I've given them so much of my paychecks <laughs> at this point <laughs> in, you know, to get, but like amazing selection of music. Yeah, um, 100%. But yeah, I'd say in terms of house music, that's like a big one, you know, and then other than that, there's other ones I've visited throughout the US and like Denver and San Francisco and random places, Boston. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I love also how like you, you definitely focus on on like house and stuff, but you you have a, a great, a grand collection of just other mm -hmm. um, records and stuff too. Um, so besides like electronic and stuff, what are kind of some genres that, you know, mm -hmm. you're like attracted to? Yeah, um, so that was the thing, like in Gainesville, it was really great because honestly, a lot of the sets I was playing on vinyl weren't even house. Okay. It was um, a lot of Brazilian music, a nice. lot of salsa, like, um stevie wonder mm -hmm. a lot of disco a lot of soul and um so for a minute i was actually trying to collect that so i went to brazil last year in january and like my focus was like i'm gonna go crazy and buy a bunch of records mm -hmm. and like really grow my brazilian music collection yeah thinking i'd get a good deal but no they're also just as expensive yeah, they are. They are. <laughs> even in brazil i know i'm doing the conversions i'm like yeah no like i'm yeah. not saving any money <laughs> i know I, w I was in brazil last year and i got some records too and yeah i thought they would be cheaper they are not no no it's about the same yeah um yeah. but yeah i mean that's a lot of what i like to play i also really love to collect reggae like Come. Shout out to WDNA, 88.9 FM. Like, there you go. Grew up yeah. on them. Like, love, love, like, I don't know where I would be. I say this all the time. I think I called in <laughs> once on one of their drives, and I was like, I'll, I'll do a shout out, you know? Like, <laughs> I love WDNA. I listen to them every day in the morning. And I think they actually played it. Oh, nice. <laughs> there you go. It's just kind of funny. Um, but, love yeah, that. so I grew up every Saturday listening to the reggae ride. So that just became kind of, like, you know, a really... I don't know, nostalgic genre of music yeah. for me. So I love to collect that on vinyl. Um, shout out to Curtis here in Miami. Um, he has always a fantastic selection of reggae music on vinyl. Um, so I'd say that's another sort of genre I like to collect. Mm -hmm. um, but since being in Miami, I don't think I've played very many sets at all that um, are like during the day. Yeah. You know, where it's like more open format. Um, in terms of world music, I think I did a couple like MCR episodes where I brought those records, mm -hmm. but you know, places like, um, I mean, yeah, just the gigs haven't catered to that as much. So yeah. it's also shaped how much I'm collecting those genres now because mm -hmm. it is so expensive. Yeah, that's um, true. I'm just focusing on collecting electronic. Yeah, right it makes sense. Nice. And then, so you, you also started uh, the party uh, record behavior, mm -hmm. no? So where did that idea and concept uh, yeah. come from? It's actually kind of funny. Um, it starts with, of my dad again shout out i think <laughs> he's watching go. right now um so he plays at the spot sunset tavern in south miami okay um it's like one of the spots he he plays at and um he was always like every time i'd go he's like telling the owners oh my god my daughter's a dj my daughter's <laughs> a dj like telling me like you should have an event there and i was always like i don't see the vision like i see bands and i see like you know different crowds yeah. i'm like i don't know how i can just turn this <laughs> into a dj thing yeah but eventually I'm like, literally, why not? Like, yeah. there's, it, it's just like, if I already have my foot in the door, like, you know, let me go for it. And originally I called it So Me Nights, 
Um, I didn't like, because I, I didn't think I was actually going to start throwing events. I was mm -hmm. just like, I thought it was going to be kind of a one-off thing. So that's why the name was so particular to South Miami. Yeah. Um, and we threw the first one and it was actually so cute and yeah. wholesome and like really, really nice. And then um, we had another one, shout out Phil and Casa Crea, they collabed and that was really cool. Um, and yeah, then I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And just the concept of organizing stuff. And, but then I realized like I needed to get more sort of organized with the vision and the intention behind the event yeah. and um, sort of like thinking really more critically about the spaces I wanted to curate or more so provide, mm -hmm. like what was lacking in the scene. And I realized like more opportunities for folks to play vinyl were lacking mm -hmm. because places like Dante's, et cetera, are just way more difficult to break into. Um, so I decided, okay, it's gonna be vinyl only. Cause that just helped me. Cause if not, I would just sit there kind of like having a creative block yeah. on like what to do for the next event or where, sh where it should be. And what should the music direction be? Who should I book? And I was like, okay, like I'm really passionate about vinyl and like giving other people more opportunities to play it. And then it also is always so special when you're out and people are seeing that. And I just talked yeah. to people in the crowds, like at Eagle Room the other week and they were like, I don't remember the last time I saw someone spinning vinyl. They're like, I think it was years ago, you yeah. know? So people really get a kick out of it too. So that's when I decided, okay, strictly vinyl. And, um, you know, Sunset Tavern ended up having a lot of other, other events. They have a lot of programming with bands. So I was like, okay, I need to find an, another space. And since then I've just been like venue hopping and seeing mm. what works. Um, and yeah, it's very, much um, as I can, as I have the capacity to, and as the spaces allow me to, and as budget allows, yeah. then I'll you know continue. So I have some goals, I'd say, for it, but um, also just so driven in other things, so it's hard yeah. to give it as much energy as it deserves, but I'm excited to see where it'll go. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I loved it, I think, um, like, I liked it at, um, at Eagle Room. It was mm -hmm. definitely a cool spot, but I also agree. I think it's cool that you, you're able to take it around, you know? Mm -hmm. I just leave it at one place. And it's also nice that you started it at kind of as, like, this small little local thing, mm -hmm. you know, in, in South Miami, especially because there's not a lot, especially for, exactly. like, kind of that scene there. You know, you, I mean, recently Fox's Lounge reopened, and that's been, like, a new, yeah. new place down there. Yeah. Um, but besides that, it hasn't really been, yeah. been a lot. Um, but I definitely do love the vision, and I think that, you know, it has a lot of potential. 100% definitely go check it out next time to buy you you know yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um yeah so besides that I know that you've played a lot around uh, Miami within the past couple years mm -hmm. so um how was that like kind of getting into the community mm -hmm. um getting your first gigs because I know especially in Miami it can be a little difficult in the beginning yeah but yeah so what was that like yeah um definitely overwhelming at times yeah. um where was like the first place you played at well, Prohibida at Domicile. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right. And then after that, I know I played the record fair. Shout out Trust Your Funk. Oh, yeah, that's a fun one. Um, maybe one of my first gigs, I think, was actually Sound Bar. Wow. In downtown. Yeah. Um, like first final gigs. Mm -hmm. um, so there was Sound Bar, um, the record fair. Um, I don't remember where else I was playing. <laughs> um, last summer, over under okay. uh, for the Bailey Funk Night. Yes. Um, yeah, and then last September was my first Ladies Night at Dante's. Nice. Um, yeah, those are some of the ones off the top of my head. Yeah. Because I was last year, I was honestly still going back to Gainesville a lot okay. to play. Okay. Which is kind of a lot. Yeah, I <laughs> like, bet. That's a long drive. Like, yeah. Florida is long. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's intense. Like almost six hours um, of gig. driving. But it was great. You know, there's some great organizers up there. Shout out Christina and Mikey. Like, still trying to cultivate a scene there. Mm -hmm. um, and so last year, there were some really fun parties that we were throwing up there. Um, shout out NFD. And, yeah, so I'd say that was really keeping me motivated okay. like knowing i still had that community up there while i was working to find that community here mm -hmm. um so yeah it was i'd say a lot at once 
Um, but it helped just knowing one or two people is what got me started. And from there, I just continue the sort of path of meeting mutuals and mutuals yeah. and just a lot of just showing up, you know, and supporting, yeah. I'd say, in the beginning, yeah. So it sounds like uh, you've definitely, like, seen the scene change a lot from the beginning to end. So how has that been from when you first got there? And I know you said you weren't really, like, DJing quite yet, but yeah. kind of like seeing even when you first started to what it is now. In Gainesville was, or yeah, in Miami? Gainesville. In Gainesville. How has that changed? So, honestly, it was really cool how when I started playing, it kind of coincided with some other DJs starting too, mm -hmm. like my best friend in the whole wide world, Christina, like she started DJing at the same time, but yeah. she's bringing more of the Latin reggaeton, like okay. um, sounds and um, Latin tech and um, all those other subgenres. So we both realized like we wanted to DJ, but also bring something a little bit different, you know, and then there was Eden and Day um, who were also becoming really active at the time. And also Maho, this other DJ, was organizing these events called Groove Garden. Okay. Um, so people like Mick, who has a residency here, played for one of them. And um, DJ Park has also played for yeah. one of those. Um, a few others. And so there was a lot of really cool underground parties happening at the time, mm -hmm. which was so fun. And I'd say now, you know, it's not quite the same, right? Like it is a brain drain city where, or cap, I forget the term, where like people graduate. It's like oh, yeah. college towns where people graduate and then they leave. Yeah. You know, and like don't stay. 100%. And it's very understandable when it comes to the fact that like what opportunities are there for you and the field that you want to be in. And if, mm -hmm. if that's DJing, then, you know, there's only so many doors to go through mm -hmm. and spaces to play. And especially spaces that encourage the sound that you want to be playing, you yeah. know? Um, so I would say it's a little different now. There's not as many, I'd say, active underground organizers there okay. currently. Um, but I think there's always, like, new new energy yeah. showing up. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I'd say right now it's not as active as it used to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that is true because it is the pro and con of like the college sound kind of vibe where mm -hmm. people come and go so it's kind of like in not, like every four years not even like even every year is like just a whole different vibe kind of thing so yeah, yeah I, I definitely get that um but so you started learning to dj over there right mm -hmm. uh did you start with records or do you start with digital what was that? digital yeah, yeah it was like during the pandemic my partner at the time gifted me a board um which to be honest if it weren't for that i don't know when i would have started yeah you know, because I always was like thinking about it and talking about it. And then suddenly I had the board. And at the time I was living in um, like a communal house. So I had a lot of roommates. Okay. And so we were able to have our own little mini, you know, house parties of just like yeah. the roommates and their partners maybe. Um, and so, yeah, I remember like New Year's 2020 going into 21. Okay. Was like my first DJ set in the backyard for me and all the roommates. Nice. And um, so, yeah, I learned digitally and then uh, I started mixing vinyl about a year later. Okay, wow. Yeah. So a big jump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what was, that, what was that like going from digital to record? Because it's like, it's similar, but definitely different. So what was yeah. that kind of like learning that? Um, definitely challenging, but to me, way more exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that, like I haven't really looked back. It's like, I know for me, it's the format I prefer as challenging and hard as it is and as many times as imperfect as it is and as it sounds it's it's exciting to me in that I can always like continue growing mm -hmm. and like becoming better at it um, and it's just so satisfying to like you know be able to take touch it and take it with you and yeah. to like be buying it in a more personal intentional way versus Although, of course, sometimes I get records online. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'd say the transition was, it felt very natural, to mm -hmm. be honest. I was like, yeah, just traveling to this gig with my records and my turntables. Yeah. And it was way harder than just walking out of the house with my headphones and my USB. Yeah, like, 100%. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, but, no, it was so worth it. Oh, like, yeah. I loved it. Yeah. And then, uh, like, that same year, that in 2022, after I had been using my friend's equipment for a little bit, I was like, okay, you know what? Like, it's time. I'm going to buy myself 
my own equipment. Mm -hmm. So then I bought my children te two Technics. That's all you need. My babies. Yeah, the best. <laughs> Um, so then when you first started uh, mixing with records, had you already been collecting or did that kind of just like coincide kind of? Yeah, like I said before, I was, you know, like I had acquired my Wallace collection, yeah. so I already had disco and yeah. salsa. I had been acquiring records from my dad. Um, I had been buying some here and there, but I wouldn't say I had a ton of house music. Okay. Like I had some that I had bought there at Mount Vernon in Baltimore. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have like I'd say enough to get me through multiple sets of like house or anything so mm -hmm. then I, I became more serious about collecting yeah, yeah. Um, do you remember what like the first uh, this general record that you ever got was you remember like first first yeah first that you bought with your own money that I bought yeah oh. um it was probably a, red, a reggae record yeah to be honest yeah, just one you found at the shop kind of thing? That must have been like, I don't know, six, seven years ago, wow. maybe more. I don't know. So oh. it's definitely been collecting for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Because like back in the day, like my dad would take me and my brother to the record store. Yeah. And, you know, we would go digging and... You let you choose some? Yeah, them? exactly. Oh, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Love that. So it's kind of hard for me to say. Yeah. Because it's been a minute, but... Yeah. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, okay. So, then you've been collecting and playing, which is kind of, like, kind of coincided. Because that's, that's another thing that I've kind of uh, come to realize, especially with, like, records. I feel like a lot of people kind of collect them first. Or, like, mm -hmm. like you, in your case, that like you kind of grew up collecting around it. And then, eventually, you kind of tie both together. Mm -hmm. Once people learn how to, like, mix and mm -hmm. see, like, you can kind of do both at the same time. So, that's, like, why it's kind of nice, um, I feel like, personally, for collecting records. Because even you said it yourself, how like each record has its own story, even if it's like you got it offline or whatever, mm -hmm. like each of them kind of bring back like a little memory and stuff like that. So I do love that about collecting records. Um, but in terms of the fact that you started with digital, have you ever really gone back to it? I know you said you haven't really looked mm -hmm. back, but has there been ever been a case where like maybe you just did like a little like digital set? And oh, stuff? yeah, all the time. Yeah. hundred percent. Like, especially with playing Bailey, those are always digital that's true um and i'll do me and steph have um the bala love party that she came up with that we've been doing since last summer um and we'll do that you know every other month or so so that's always digital um and yeah there's definitely you know instances where maybe i'm playing like a warehouse party or something yeah. and you know there's just you can't beat the crazy remixes that you find on soundcloud to be honest that's true like, yeah crazy you know and i'm just like no this is super cool i want to be able to play this so i'm doing hybrid sets pretty often like this friday i'll be doing a hybrid set there you go. um and um yeah so no i don't think electronics ever fully stopped yeah um just you know the nature of like like um when i played at jolene um a couple months ago That's maybe right. for suichi because of his live setup they could yeah. only fit one turntable so it had to be a hybrid set, you know, or, or digital, of course. Um, yeah. So you always got to be flexible, always got to be ready um, to, you know, having music on your USB and yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Sadly, I mean, it is it is nice that like I think it's it's gotten definitely gotten a lot more um, like uh, common, yeah. you know, for it to be like just records. But I think, yeah, especially nowadays, it's, it is important to at least have like USB. Oh, yeah. Um, load it up because, yeah. It's like it's it's more common than ever for, for it to just be like purely digital, but it is definitely a renaissance. I feel like for for records and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, going back to you talking about uh, Jolene, what was that like opening up for like Soichi? You said that yeah. like, it was like the live set, and you had only one uh, turntable. But what was yeah. that like? That was really nice. Um, I enjoyed getting ready for that set because you know I listened to a lot of his music for inspiration and found his like sumo jungle record which oh, yeah. oh my gosh i honestly wish i bought it and <laughs> then i would have gotten to play it this week that's true but um you know it's like 250 dollars oh my god okay no, <laughs> at least not. i might be more maybe more like three or 350 Jeez. um but i loved his range of sound yeah so it was fun like getting ready for that um but to be honest on 
the topic of Jolene, I will say the first time I played there for me was the most special. Really? Because um, I was opening for Chez. Oh, here. yeah. And um, in that case, I was playing like right before him. Like for Suichi, it was me and then Adam at the door. Yeah. And then, but in this case, I was opening for Chez and he got there like really early. Yeah. <laughs> like. 30 minutes before wow. I finished playing, he's just sitting there with me. Wow. And I was like, ah, That's so cool. Terrifying. But I'm also like, this is so cool. Yeah. So, like, every time I turn around to face the records, he's, like, sitting there. Wow. So, like, if I'm talking to myself out loud, like, what am I going to play next? You know, yeah. like, he's hearing me or whatever. Or I'll put on a track and he'll be like, what do you know about this song or yeah. whatever. And so it was, like, honestly the craziest experience I think I've had. Like, I don't – like, I've opened for, like, Young Marco at Floyd, but – um that there wasn't as much sort of crossover with our sets or him being there and i think our sounds are a little bit more different and chez is just such a legend in the yeah. space of house music that i like to play and so having him there was like crazy yeah. um so that was like definitely one of the most special sets i've had i feel like yeah i yeah. bet yeah I definitely i mean there's nothing like playing with like an a legend and like an icon that you you know you admire that's definitely a really cool um, experience 100 percent um so then you, you talk a lot about like the electronic music that um, has kind of forged you to what uh, you play now, which is like a lot of house, but is there any other like uh, genres? I know you talked about mm -hmm. the, the low tempo dub um, mm -hmm. that first introduced you, but what are kind of like other genres that maybe people don't really think that you mm -hmm. kind of listen to a lot on your own, you know? I like that question, yeah, yeah. because I actually had a huge era of listening to like ukg okay and like wubby stuff yeah. drum and bass all of that like i actually love that music yeah just barely play it um so that's why i was really excited about the gig this week because i'll get to bring out that side of me what, what's um, the gig at what? oh yeah shirley's um at gramps free friday night august 2nd i'm opening 10 to 11 and go. um yeah so i definitely um have always liked that side of electronic but um yeah i think a lot of it just comes down to you know what spaces i'm able to enter and what mm -hmm. sound makes sense in those spaces um so i won't play it as much so i think probably a lot of people don't know that i also like to play that yeah yeah nice and then um i kind of like learning about uh what people like what their biggest inspirations are just in general um doesn't necessarily need to be just electronic or it can be whatever it is but kind of like five records like five albums that um, personally have like influenced you like greatly, you know? Like what are like five albums that you can think of that have formed the sound that you play now, you know? Like who you are. Mm. So definitely I'd say North by Sango. Okay. Um, I, that came out like when I was in high school and um, I was, just like obsessed that yeah. was like when i first started paying more attention to um that different side of electronic music like sango and Kitranada and all of yeah. them um that was probably also while i was in high school i remember seeing sango at three points i think my first three points in like 2015 or something wow. sango played and um just love what he's done ever mm -hmm. since with merging the influence of brazilian music and yeah. sounds in his song so um he's definitely been really influential for me i would say mm -hmm. um and in terms of just inspirations in general i loved um dj seinfeld's um dj kicks yes album yeah. like such like for me it's like maybe what i dj i might not listen to all the time on my own yeah you know just sitting at home or working yeah but it's these other genres of electronic that or producers that while i might not dj necessarily like it's the emotion behind that electronic music that like always motivates me and yeah. like helps me feel grounded um so i'd say those records for sure yeah um or those tracks um yeah yeah. This is like a couple. Nice. I can and what, what, like, let's, uh, let's pretend that like you just did like a four or five hour, like just pure like house or just like more intense yeah. kind of set. And it's like 4 a.m. and you're like driving home, walking home, whatever the case. What would be like what you throw on or not even not throw on yeah. in terms of to like go home, you know? Yeah. So there's this album by Computer Data. Um, 
I can't remember the name of it, but there's these tracks on there called Valoran um, and Glacier. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, <laughs> but that whole album is like very nostalgic, sort of like, I don't know, driving at 3 a.m. on the highway, yeah. like electronic music. Um, so that's like my turn on and play when I'm on my way home and yeah. like, yeah, just like coming down from like the adrenaline, relaxing, also getting in my fuels and you know, feeling nostalgic. No one else is on the highway but me. Yeah. Windows down. It's the best. Yeah. It's the best yeah. feeling. There's nothing like it. And I know you mentioned that, you know, you went to Three Points uh, way back when. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of other acts. So I kind of want to know what are kind. What was like the first concert that you remember going to? Yeah. So believe it or not, the first one I ever went to when I was in second grade was the Cheetah Girls. Second. Wow. <laughs> Cheetah Girls in second grade. <laughs> <laughs> but then, like, <laughs> real life, you know, concert. It still um, counts. Yeah, right? Um, I went to see Social Distortion at the Fillmore with my dad okay. when I was, like, in middle school. I was, like, 10 <laughs> or something. But That's I'm like, cool. yeah, this is normal. We're just going to a rock concert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. And then I went and saw Muse with my mom. Oh, wow. Probably also in middle school, maybe. That's cool. Um, yeah, so some of my early concerts, nice. I think. Yeah, and what was uh, your favorite concert that you've been to that you remember? Like, ever? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It can also be, I also mm. welcome DJ sets and live, you know, stuff like that, because yeah. it's definitely... Mm, favorite still important. one ever? <laughs> you know... I hate to put you on the spot. The first Rolling Loud okay. was, like, actually amazing. Yeah, that one was in Bayfront, no? Was it? No, the first one was in Wynwood at oh. Soho Studios. Nice. And the headliners were, like, Schoolboy Q and Action Bronson. Oof. And I got to see Currency. When was this? What year was this? I think this is also 2015. Okay. I don't think it was 2014, but it was, like, one of those yeah. years. Yeah. Um, I'd say that, like, like the first Experience. three points and the first Rolling Loud. I didn't. I don't think I went to the first first three points, but yeah. the one in twenty fifteen, mm -hmm. um, like seeing Kitronada was of course life changing. Yeah. Especially like at that time in yeah. his prime. He might, he might still be in his prime, but yeah, you know, yeah, you know. <laughs> you know, for me it was like when it was all really new for me. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, being at that Rolling Loud, like that was when I was really getting exposed to like going to different concerts but now for for me and for the sounds that i wanted to hear yeah and those were really monumental i i remember just having so much fun and um really appreciated those that those spaces existed and yeah i think i appreciate them even more now because i see how big three points has become and how yeah. big rolling loud has become so i'm really grateful that i got to experience it when they were still way more intimate yeah 100 percent. yeah both have, have definitely grown into these monumental things i mean rolling loud i think is all over the country now um True. and three points yeah i mean every year they get bigger and bigger and i love to see it but yeah especially like in those intimate small moments like those are things that you know you you can always bring back be like oh i remember when mm -hmm, when it mm -hmm. was like this you know it was smaller yeah um but yeah and then to tie it off you know we did the the first the the favorite and then the most recent what was like the most recent concert or even dj set that you went to um it was during Art Basel. This DJ was here at Data for Black Lives, and they were from France. And it's really hard to pronounce their name, but it was like Guard de la Femme or okay. something like that. And their set was like incredible. Yeah. Like amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super cool. And yeah, they came all the way from, I think, Marcel, France. Uh huh. And they were playing there, and it was like awesome. Wow! Like really, really amazing, amazing yeah. set. I think I, I might have heard of them. But I definitely got to, got to check them out. That's yeah, really cool. Yeah, I can drop their at later too. Yeah, for sure. Um, so then, when you when you go out to Miami, I know you said that you go to uh, tea bags for records and mm -hmm. stuff. What's kind of like um, like your process when you go out looking for for records? And what um, are like places that you like to hit? So my process usually begins with. Um, whether or not I have a gig coming up mm -hmm. that will that I already know kind of what sound I want to curate. Yeah. It's definitely fun to just go for fun and just dig and see what I find. I've done plenty of those for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll that's like the first step of the process. And so if it's like I know I have 
a set coming up where I want to be playing a lot of house. Mm. Um, then I'll know that sort of going into the shop and either like a tea bag, you know, you can literally just tell Tamer, hey, this is, you know, what I'm looking for. And he'll yeah. just start picking out a bunch of stuff. Um, or I'll just kind of do my own thing at like technique or something like that and just start pulling out records. And um, a lot of times, especially when I'm at shops, even outside of Miami, that I'm just going through their like $3 bins and $1 bins. I just like look at the artwork, I look at the colors, yeah. look yeah. at the year, look at the vibe, and I'm just like, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. this looks cool, this looks cool. And then I just spend so much time listening to them and like really thinking about it. And um, yeah, just giving myself a very, very loose budget. Yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> a budget, but it's loose. Yeah, because it's so easy to go over, and you can never put like a hard, a hard cap on it. Yeah. I feel like oh, it, it adds up so quick. Yeah. It's really bad. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's also why sometimes online is a little better. You get to compare. But, yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely nice to shop local. Um, and there's a lot of really good shops, I feel like, in, in Miami. You know, we're definitely pretty privileged. I remember somebody said, um, especially since you go around and you visit record shops, you can tell a lot by a city, by their record, like, stores and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You can definitely see, like, what the scene is like and stuff. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think that's pretty much, um, pretty much it. I think okay. it was an awesome conversation. Yeah. You know, thank you so much for telling us all a little bit about everything um, that you got going on. Um, and speaking of, where can the people find you both physically and uh, on digitally, you know? Yeah, so Lotus Soap on Instagram um, and on SoundCloud. Um, yeah, and on Resident Advisor. So, yeah. you know, any shows coming up there will be um, posted. And, yeah, that's the best way to follow yeah. me. There you go. All right. Well, we'll head to, to the decks and yeah, see you there. Okay. Thank you. And thanks for interviewing me. Yeah, of course. Thank you for coming on.